You're listening to The Long Game Podcast. I'm your host, Sandra Scaiano. I am so excited to bring you today's episode. My true belief is that you can build a business around whatever it is that drives you. My guest today is Dr. Christy Sumner, a paranormal investigator, historian, and museum co-founder. Christy has woven her passion for historic stories and the paranormal to create not one, but two successful businesses. Soul Sisters Paranormal, and the historic Scott County Jail Museum. Today, we talk about her first overnight stay in a haunted penitentiary, the technical skills she and her team have developed to produce their content and to share these stories wider, and how a new partnership bloomed into a super cool reimagining of a historic location. What I find so amazing about what Christy has done is that she has built multiple facets into her business and they all flow seamlessly. Nothing feels extraneous or pushed. And that's a real skill, right? To know what extensions to add and how to bring them to life. And she has done this all organically. Christy shares her story of how their first YouTube video came about, and it really doesn't get any more organic than this. Today, the long game is Paranormal with Dr. Christy Sumner. You're listening to The Long Game Podcast with Sandra Scaiano. In a world where everyone is doing, it's easy to get lost in a sea of comparison, secret tricks, and promises of overnight success. The Long Game is my approach to business, the actual day-in and day-out philosophy that you have to show up, you have to do the work, and there's no quick fixes for long-term success. I'm a web designer, digital strategist, and energetic thinker, and I'm here to share the process and lessons I experience with my clients daily who are going through the same struggles of building a business as you are. We'll hear from successful entrepreneurs sharing their long game strategies. And I'm fun, so we're going to have a little fun along the way too. Thanks for being here. Let's get to today's episode. Welcome, everyone. I am so excited for today's guest. We have Christy Sumner of Soul Sisters Paranormal and the historic Scott County Jail with us today. And we are going to dive into some alternative universes here today. And of course, talk business and how this all came about. So welcome, Christy. Thank you, Sandra. I appreciate being here today. I'm so excited. When you and I met online, one of the things that really drew me to you in your work is you can build a business around anything, you know, like this is what you love, right? Mm -hmm. Like people come to me sometimes or you hear online and they're like, what should I do? It's like, do what you want to do. And this is like a great example because your business, it's an alternative industry, paranormal investigation, right? So, you know, tell us how you got into that, first of all, and a little bit of your background. Sure, absolutely. So my official title is actually Dr. Christy Sumner. And uh, I say that not gloatingly, but I say that because my previous life, um, I was a college professor. I was a senior director for a registered traveler program. My background is actually in biometric identification for airport access control. So I was actually in corporate world, you know, technical corporate world for years. And to your point, it's one of those things that really evolved into doing what I love through paranormal investigations. So my sisters and I, we come from a very research-minded background. We all have advanced degrees. And um, we would routinely get together and take girls trips to different cities uh, across the country just to have a weekend where we could all meet up and just be sisters together and do something different. Totally. <laughs> yeah. So in, t in 2014, we had the opportunity to go to Moundsville, West Virginia, which is where the West Virginia State Penitentiary is located. And we had a family friend that sat on the board of that facility. And he said, while you're here, why don't you just take one of your nights and stay in the, the penitentiary and see if you oh can gosh, communicate with our right. spirits? So we did, and we absolutely loved the experience. And, and we came away with what we felt was compelling paranormal evidence. We heard footsteps, door slamming, you know, voices when we knew that there was nobody in those cell blocks. And so what we decided to do wow. is after we left that experience, we really wanted to try to elevate paranormal investigations as best as, as, best as we could into a more professional situation um, because, you know, paranormal investigations obviously is something that's a subculture, but right, we wanted totally. to kind of, yeah, so we wanted to bring that conversation more into the mainstream. 
Yeah, um, legitimize so we, it too a bit. Yeah, absolutely. So we formed Soul Sisters Paranormal, and uh, you know we we had our our theme music created, we had our logo created, we went ahead and um, got our copyright and our trademark for all of that. So while we are a, primarily Soul Sisters is a self funded business, we act and um, operate as a, a profit making business. Awesome. So let me ask you on that first stay at the penitentiary, like. How did you prepare yourselves? Like you were not <laughs> soul sisters at this point, right? And someone said, why no. don't you spend the night? It'll be fun. You'll like spook yourselves, right? Like, so how did you prepare for that? Like that first night, like you didn't have all the equipment, the night vision cameras and the EVP sensing, um, <laughs> uh, you know, equipment. Like what was that first night like that sparked everything? It was a pretty interesting, a, a very, to your point, very rudimentary investigation. We did have some <laughs> digital cameras and we had voice recorders, just, you know, some voice recorders we picked up at Walmart. But what we also had was the historical narrative of the prison. Right. Our grandpa was actually a prison guard there when it was an operation before he became oh, chief wow. of police. And so we had that historical background and we all love history. So we've d we did a deep dive into the research. And uh, just to be in that building was so incredible. So we did uh, put out those voice recorders. We did take a lot of pictures. We did acquire one night vision camera that first night, a video camera. And so we picked up some very interesting things. Like I said, we left voice recorders in different parts of the building. Even though we weren't there, we still had ears in the right. environment there. And so we were picking up footsteps when we knew that there was nobody else there. We were hearing doors slamming. And it really is one of those situations where your other senses become heightened immediately. So you, cause it's all dark. So you're not relying right. on your sense of sight, but you know, your hearing becomes extremely acute, your feelings, your smell becomes very acute. And uh, so that's really what we learned from that first experience. And then after that, every subsequent investigation, it's a learning process, right? Everything that we do is a learning process because I mean, investigating the St. Augustine Lighthouse is much different than inve investigating the West Virginia State Penitentiary. So you have to learn and adapt to that environment, but also using techniques that we feel are true paranormal investigation techniques. And let's go into a little bit that emotional piece of things, because you are not going to happy places, you know, like all of these, <laughs> there has been, I mean, the Lizzie Borden house, there was like a double murder where they were, you know really terribly slayed. Mm -hmm. You know, the penitentiary, they're, you know, not to sensationalize, but they're not, you know, they're evil dwellings type of thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. In terms of that. So, you know, you're going into these places, you're not finding happy spirits, so to speak, necessarily, <laughs> you know, in that respect. Like, what is your mindset for preparing for that? And what have you encountered in that way? Well, the first thing that we do when we go into an investigation is we really, to your point, prepare ourselves both spiritually and mentally and physically. And by that, I mean, we say a prayer of protection before we go in. Now, everybody in my group, we're Christians. So we, you know, we say a prayer of protection. And that's really just to, you know, protect ourselves in the environment. And mm -hmm. we really set our expectations as well with both ourselves and the spirits. So we'll go in and we'll say, we are legitimately here to tell your story. If you want to communicate with us in any way, this is how you do it. You're not allowed to hurt us. You're not allowed to touch us. You're not allowed to come home with us. But we want to hear your story. And, you know, a lot of people may say, oh, that's just crazy and nuts. But, you know, for me, I do believe that there is energy that is available to speak to us if we listen. And those spirits want to tell their story. And I think we've gotten some very compelling evidence because of that. So to your point, when you go into these locations that are dark and more heavy, you know, we don't look for anything that's quote unquote evil. We don't look for anything that's demonic. We legitimately want to tell stories, both the historical narrative of the location and the story of any spirit that wants to communicate with us. And that's really how we prepare for those investigations. As I said before, we do a, a very deep dive into the historical perspective of the location because we feel that is extremely important. And then we couple that with any paranormal evidence that we find during the night. And I um, believe in this energy. So I can only imagine that your intention comes through to that the spirit world. You're not there to disrupt, to, you know, and I use those other words as like a, uh, a reference point, but your intention comes through because mm -hmm. you're there 
in a peaceful way and in a historical way rather than a disruptive way. So I'm sure they feel that and respond to that in, in a rightful way. Well, well, thank you for saying that. And, you know, when we first started this, obviously there were television shows, Ghost Hunters, Ghost Adventures and stuff. Right. And their main goal is to sensationalize because they need to get right. an audience base. And I completely understand that. If, if that's how they want to operate and that's what they want to do in showcase, God bless them. But for us, we do not provoke. We do not go in with bravado or any type of sensationalism. What we produce are videos that, you know, show, again, that historical story of the location, how we conduct the investigation and anything unexplainable that we find. And, um, you know, that's that's what we want to put out there. Now, it may not be fast paced. It may not be, you know, instant for the, the YouTube crowd or the Instagram or TikTok crowd. But for us, it's really true to how we do the investigations. Totally. And the videos you create, everyone will be linking to um, Dr. Christie's website, Soul Sisters Paranormal. So you can go watch. They have extensive videos on all of the places they've done these investigations. And, you know, you don't even need to bring the sensationalism. Like it's there <laughs> when you're going through an old Victorian house and you're, you know, the old door creaks. It just naturally creaks, right? So <laughs> all those natural pieces, uh, those elements add to the story without big, flashes of light or things like that. So, you know, I think you achieve that. And, you know, I'm a history buff myself. And so I really love that, like, oh, you're telling us a little bit about the area of Falls River, Massachusetts, where Lizzie Borden was, uh, you know, they lived. And what I also thought was interesting, I, I'll reference that one video, is you told the after story as well. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't just stop at the sensationalism of we did the investigation here. You went on to talk about they left that house and went to another home and stayed in the area and what happened and like how they were viewed by the community. Like mm -hmm. the whole story, it was complete rather than just like we're stopping at the sensationalism piece. Well, thank you for saying that. And, and that to me is important, right? Because a lot of these investigators, they will stop at what causes the quote unquote haunting and not go into that. You know, the Lizzie Borden for me is a very interesting example because, you know, this was a story of a lady who was charged with two murders in 1892, and she was acquitted of those murders. Very horrific, but she stayed in the area. And to me, if I've just been acquitted of two extremely high-profile murders, I'm out of there. But, her, you know, the house that she bought was literally a mile and a half down the road, and she right. stayed there for the rest of her life. And to me, I felt that that story needed to be told. I thought that was so interesting, too, because the acquittal came by a group of, you know, 10 men judges. And mm -hmm. I thought it was so interesting because they really, in these, in the 1800s, got into forensics. They were like, there wasn't blood splattered everywhere for her. Like, I thought that was so interesting that, because, you know, we tend to think like, lock her up, up, she was there. Like, that was really insightful, I thought, of them to acquit her, whether, I don't know whether she did it or not, right? But- mm -hmm. I thought that was very interesting because they were not doing it on emotion. They were using forensics mm -hmm. to really make this decision back at that time. Absolutely. And like I said, I think that's why the story needs to be told. And that's really the case with all of the locations that we go to. You know, we don't want to just stop at this is the investigation. OK, we're done. Goodbye. We want to continue that story out. What is going on with the location now? What what is the future prospects for the location or what is the end of the story like the Lizzie Borden or the Velisca Axe Murder House or some of these other like Ma Barker? You know, what was the story? Because it just didn't stop with the event that happened at the location. And we we always feel that that's very important. Totally. I love that you see it all the way through. So, you know, one of the other pieces to your work is this whole technical aspect. Like you and your team needs to have a lot of technical skill. And we'll talk about as, you know, entrepreneurs that we need to be videographers. We need to be copywriters. All of these things, like you as well. Not only are you going into this these places and doing this historical research, that is an expertise that you have. But you are, you know, making videos of the whole thing. You're being videographers. You're uh, using this the audio software. So can you tell us a little bit about that journey of like, all right, we've perfected a little bit along the way, or how that came about, like, and and really that that piece that you you needed to develop. Absolutely. And and it is still an evolution, believe me. Uh, you know, when we, when, we, when we first started Soul Sisters, 
it was never, in my mind, designed to be anything like it is. You know, we came up, like I said, we came up with a cool cool. logo. And and it really was about getting together with my sisters and my friends and doing something unique. We knew we'd meet different people along the way, but we never dreamed we'd develop a quote unquote following. The videos really started because I have a very extensive family and they're all over the world. And so they started asking, what was it like? What did you feel? What did you see? How was this? How was that? And so I really just put together the first video to kind of showcase that. And one of my cousins said, well, just put it on YouTube because that's easier for us to get the link. Da, 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 da. So we put it on <laughs> right. YouTube, right? And it started getting likes and hits and comments. I'm like, okay, well, this is wow. interesting. And Total um, organic, right? Like Absolutely. Absolutely wow. organic. Believe me, if I had any thought into where this was going to go, I mean, I do a lot of things that were different, like my, like my logo, right? I've got about 20 right. different colors in the logo and finding screen and printing. It's a skull. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, but, you know, that, that's something. And, and, you know, just, just different things that I, as I look back now, it would be a little bit different. But I'm very proud of how we've evolved into how we've evolved. So the first couple of videos that I put together, I mean, I look back at them now and I'm like, oh, my gosh, they look like home movies made on VHS. But everyone, it, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> but, you know, you do have to learn the software. You have to learn, you know, the lighting in these locations. I mean, we're completely dark. So we had yeah, to find that's some fascinating lighting to me. Are mm-hmm. you shooting in like infrared, like uh, night vision cameras? Like most of what we do is night vision. Um, so when we, you know, let me just backtrack just a little bit. So when we first enter a location, the very first thing that we do is we set up our voice recorders in different parts of the building or wherever we're at. And then we set up night vision video cameras. Our idea is that we want eyes and ears on as much of the location as we can. Even if we're not in a room, we want eyes and ears in that room. And so all of that is done in night vision. And obviously we have the audio that's there. And so then when we walk around and do what we call EVP sessions, you know, we'll have some handheld equipment with us. And then we also all wear body cameras. And that's for two, mm-hmm. two reasons. One, the first is to capture the video of our experience. And the second one it is it gives me a timestamp of where everybody is on the location during the night. So if we hear oh, something cool. or see some type of anomaly, I'll cross-reference where everybody is to make sure that we didn't cause that. You know, mm-hmm. that somebody didn't hit a chair or sneeze or cough or something like that. That way we can truly say that what we found is unexplainable. And so that's really what I draw the videos from are a lot of the night visions. And we do take a video with our our iPhones. So I'll interject some of those just for a little bit better, clearer reference of where we're at in the location. But a lot of what we do is from the the night vision, either the body cameras or the, uh, the stationary cameras that we have set up. Wow. So you also, so you've had to perfect the shooting aspect. Do you also handle the editing aspect because you are so close to the story or do you have people that you work with? I do. Uh, So uh, my sisters and I, we will all be involved in the research aspect of it. So everybody then kind of sends me the, the clips of the research. And then what we do is when we're done with the investigations, we take all of our audio and all of our video and we sit and listen to it all and watch it all. So if I've got 10 video cameras running for 10 hours, I'm watching 100 hours of footage and then I'm wow. listening to, you know, 100 hours of audio and we don't put it through any software. We listen to it as we captured it because we want to make sure that we're not missing anything. And so it's a, it's a pretty tedious process. It usually takes about a month to two months, depending on the location, to get all the evidence gone through, all the footage watched, all the uh, audio listened to, and then we narrow that down and put that into the video. So that's that's how we really start the process. And then we'll clip everything and then um, I'll take all of that. I'll do the narration based on the, the I mean, I'll write the script. I'll do the narration right, right. and then put everything together and then release it. Wow. It really is a production. And it I is. will say that you and your team have really fine tuned your uh, listening skills because in those videos, you'll say, listen for the voice and it'll it'll play. And then you'll say, we're playing it again. And then you do like an amplified version. And that was the only part I heard when you (laughs) did the amplified piece, which I really appreciated. But it made me think like, wow, you are all so in tune. If you're sitting here listening to 10 hours of audio from different spots, and you've got to pick up on that voice Mm -hmm. speaking, which it could just be, you know, so 
I thought that was really interesting <laughs> that you have such fine tune, you know, you're tuned into what your work is. Well, well, thank you. And I appreciate you saying that. And, and to your point, it has become, you know, something that we're, we're pretty capable of doing now. You know, it, it, it really is. The first thing you've got to have is patience to just sit down and listen to all of this. And most mm-hmm. of the time, like 99.9% of the time, you know, we'll put on our headphones and we're listening, you know, I'll just lay on the couch and read a book or something while I'm listening. And it's mostly just static, just <laughs> for a hundred hours of just, <laughs> so when something interrupts that, for me, mm-hmm. I can very quickly pick it up. And so right. that, that's kind of how we've, we've fine-tuned uh, that skill. And, uh, and then what we'll do is, so say I'm listening to this piece of audio and I hear something, I'll clip it. And then I'll send it to the rest of the team and say, do you hear something? I don't tell them what I hear. I don't say, you know, listen for a noise, a sound, a voice. I don't say anything. I say, do you hear something? And then individually, they'll send it back to me and like, no, I don't hear anything. Or yes, I hear this. And then we'll come up with a consensus. And if we don't all hear it, then I don't put it out there. Now, there may be differences in what we hear. For example, I may hear waterfall and Jenny may hear watermelon. And so we'll just decide, okay, well, we're going to caption it as waterfall. And mm-hmm. so that, that's kind of, um, you know, subjective on our part. But, you know, that's why we say we believe we hear this. Now, if you hear something mm-hmm. else, let us know. But as we're listening to it, we believe we hear this. This whole work is subjective. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> right? So it's kind of like, hey, we're coming along on the story with you because none of it is concrete, really. Mm-hmm, it's exactly. just what you're interpreting things as. Mm-hmm. So that's super cool. And it really does give me a new passion for going back through my old work <laughs> and like transcribing some things when I'm like, <laughs> you know, as I was listening, we're listening to your 100 hours uh, per episode. I was like, all right, I can do it. You can do it. I can it, go yes. back and get a, a couple of full quotes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, kind of back to your comment, about the, uh, being subjective, you know, that is kind of the point with this as well. You know, we're not trying to convince anybody of that where mm-hmm. we've gone is haunted. We're not trying to convince anybody that if you don't believe this, you're wrong. What we do is we put together videos that highlight our investigation. And then when we control for everything environmentally that we can control for during these investigations, what we're left with is the unexplainable. And so we'll put it out there and say, We've controlled for everything. This happened to us. It's unexplainable. If you want to come to us and say, I think it's this, then I want to have that dialogue because I don't want to put out anything that, you know, for us isn't real or true. And so that's why, you know, we're very meticulous about how we phrase things. You know, very rarely will I say, oh, this is absolutely haunted. No, we found things in this moment that we can't explain. And that's how we put it out there. It's not trying to get anybody to believe us. Now, if you want to just watch for the historical perspective, fantastic. If you want to watch for the paranormal perspective, again, fantastic. And we appreciate that. But we're not out there trying to convince anybody that what we're saying is concrete proof of the afterlife. To us, it's very compelling and unexplainable. That's an awesome approach. I want to shift also to you've got another aspect of your business as well (laughs) that is equally as historical and um, also has some alternative facets to it as well. And it is the historic Scott County Jail Museum. And so Mm -hmm. in this museum, you have obviously taken over a landmark space, created a museum where you have um, history and objects of crime and punishment. You have an escape room, you have merchandising, you do tours, and you allow people to have their own paranormal experience at the jail. Mm -hmm. Uh, You've also created a podcast. So let's talk about <laughs> this facet of your business, this multifaceted approach mm-hmm. on this piece. So tell us a little bit too, how it evolved or when after Soul Sisters and give us a description. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a great example to your point of something that was a passion of mine that has evolved into this amazing business and something that I'm proud of and, and what I love to do. So like I said, we started Soul Sisters in 2014. And about three and a half years ago, we met up with another paranormal investigator. Her name was Miranda Young, and she has a show called Ghost Biker Explorations. And um, I followed her show. I I think it's fantastic how she puts together her videos and her historical narrative on the locations as well. So I was very impressed with what she did. So I reached out to her and I said, hey, um, congratulations on your season. You know, if you'd ever want to meet up sometime and do a collaboration investigation, I'm all in. And so So she- 
Yeah. So she reached back out and said, hey, let's do this. And so after about you know three months of, of emailing back and forth, we met in North Carolina. She, she and I, and we did a collaboration investigation and we became fast friends. So she is from this area, which is Scott County, Tennessee. Her father, unfortunately, died a couple of years ago, and then she lost her job due to COVID. And so we were both in a, a point in our lives where we kind of had the freedom to explore this thing that we really wanted to do together. And that is to open a historical location and couple that with paranormal research. And so she knew that this building, which was it's the historic Scott County Jail, it had been vacant since 2008. And so she knew it was sitting here because she's from the county. And right, she right. said, why don't we just put together a business plan and go talk to the town council and see if they'll allow us to take over the building. And so we sat for probably about a month and a half and we got all of our numbers together. We had tourism numbers. We looked at our outreach plan. We looked at our marketing plan. We came up with merchandising plans. Miranda has a very strong background in graphic design and marketing and management. And so coupling that with my experience in business, it really was a great fit. And so, like I said, when we presented our idea to the mayor and the aldermen, it was one of those where we had every I dotted and every T crossed. I mean, we could tell you the numbers, the outreach numbers that we wanted to attain um, with our marketing plan of going out and really doing guerrilla marketing to all of the neighboring communities. And so they, they allowed us to do it. They were very impressed with our plan. And so then, you know, once we got the go ahead, we really became the entire face of the business. Uh, you know, you and I were talking earlier and we're everything from the janitor to the designers, to the display organizers, to the marketing, to everything in between. It's just the two of us. And I am extremely proud wow. of of what we've accomplished. Now, there obviously there was a lot of learning to do. I mean, sales tax, learning about sales tax pretty much kicked my yeah. butt. <laughs> so, you know, and stuff a different like that. industry of tourism. I mean, you're not mm -hmm. just going from, you're going into something else as well that you have to learn all about. Absolutely. And it really is neat because we traveled, both of us individually with our paranormal teams, we've traveled across the country. And so we know what paranormal tourism looks like. We know what, as investigators, we wanted. You know, we mm -hmm. wanted a location that was close to a hotel. We wanted a location that had power, um, you know, different things like that. And so we were able to take our knowledge as paranormal investigators and our business sense, as well as, you know, what we enjoy as tourists and really come up with this really unique concept. And uh, one of the things that I looked at for about a year was paranormal tourism. And it is a very, very hot topic right now because people want these unique experiences, especially coming yeah. off of COVID. You know, they don't want to go to Disney World. They want to have um, locations mm -hmm. where, you know, you have this immersive experience with history and then also after dark experiences. And so we've been able to marry that very well, I believe. And it really is just a, this great, unique package. I think what we've done. If you look at us just from the outside, it looks like we have a, a very robust company, but it's really just Amazing, the two of yes. us. That is one of the things that I commented you on is that everything really seems to fit. I mean, your the logo design, the whole look of everything, even like the outside the door of the space, you know, with the um, stain, like it's all done with a particular eye and every aspect, all the different facets on all the different touch points that you've created for the business, they all really seem to fit. Like nothing seems pushed or as if it doesn't belong. So I want to ask you in that respect, did you open with, let's say the museum and then, and the merchandising and tours, and then maybe add the escape room later, or did you open it all at the same time? Or did that tourism piece evolve as well? It gradually evolved to include the escape room, but we knew that when we wanted to open, we couldn't just have the building, even though the building is spectacular, right? I mean, we're sitting in a building that was built in 1904. It was an operation as a jail until 2008. So just the historical perspective of this building is fascinating in and of itself. But we knew that we probably couldn't get a lot of people in that just wanted to look at a building. And right. so we started out, we took about two months and, uh, you know, we had all of our graphics done we obviously both put in a financial stake into this. So we use that to have the graphics done, get our website up and running, uh, get displays in the museum. We created an audio tour so that when you go through, the audio tour is just playing on your yeah. phone if you scan the QR code. And That's so we so knew cool. that, that when we opened the doors day one, we wanted that experience. 
So we're still building on all of those things. We're still getting more displays and more items to to hang up on the walls and such newspaper articles and stuff. But we wanted something that when you come in here, you're spending, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, depending on, you know, how much you want to evolve yourself in, in, in this. And that's how we really started. And then we added different things. We had the paranormal part as well. We have a, a very strong community in the paranormal community. So we knew that once we opened the doors, the paranormal would grab our crowd. And so we relied on that as well. So you can come in, a paranormal group can come in at night and you know, rent the building from eight at night to three in the morning. And so that is a revenue stream that we knew we could get very quickly. And so that's what we capitalized on. And you in, leave them the there beginning. like no attendance or do you, are you there as guides for that experience? Not so much guides, but one of us does sit in our little office room just in case something happens. You know, that's, you know. Right. Totally. Our liability insurance says that. (laughs) Totally. Totally. Anyway, (laughs) uh, so you learned about that real quickly, too. But uh, so one of us does stay on site. So we're on site, but out of sight. And most locations, uh, paranormal investigators expect that. You know, there's a docent or somebody that kind of sits on site. And it helps that the building is extremely haunted, you know, so Mm -hmm. that's a great draw as well. And so that wow. was, that is, yeah, that is really our basic revenue stream right now. But to your point, we also started out with a very robust gift shop. So even when the first day we opened, we had t-shirts, we had books, we had different things because what we also wanted to do is because this is a community building, we wanted to invite other artisans and craftsmen and authors to participate in our gift shop. And so we have local authors who have written books. We have people who have made soaps. We have people who have made knives and different things that we sell in our gift shop and really become the face to allow others to say, hey, it's not just us, it's the entire community that's taking part in this building. And so, as I said before, this is something that we sat down and for about a month and a half before we even approached the town and we had all of this in place. I mean, we knew what the merchandise was going to look like and all of that. And to me, I'm extremely proud of that because, you know, we could have just said, hey, give us the keys, let us try this. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to start out with a bang and really show people that we are legitimate in what we're doing. And like I said, it's something that every day I come in here and I'm saying, wow, we we built this and it's pretty awesome. Yeah. And it's clever. And that well thought out plan really comes through. I mean, Mm -hmm. nothing looks, like I said, it's all seamless and so artistic and professional. And I also love that whole community aspect of it because you weren't just doing this for yourselves. You have a bigger mission mm-hmm. of the history, the community, the stories that you're telling and you're weaving in. Mm-hmm. And I love that you're giving the experience to other people who don't want that paranormal experience, right? Like right. you've now used this other piece with the escape room to, you know, families come in and see, yep. hey, can we, you know, <laughs> for those of you who aren't familiar, escape rooms are basically like a riddle and a puzzle that you've got to figure out to get the key to get out of the room, right? And exactly. so you have created a storyline of you're wrongfully accused of a crime you didn't commit. And you know other inmates in the jail know who framed you and there are hidden untraceable clues inside the room for you to follow. <laughs> and you have 60 minutes to identify your accuser and escape the jail. And you know, before being like sentenced to life. So there's a big <laughs> ramification in your uh, imaginary world. But That is cool because Mm -hmm. that brings, you know, a family with two teenagers in to experience Mm -hmm. this and to experience this historic venue, maybe to buy a shirt along the way to help your mission. I just think that is a super cool aspect. So it, you know, it's the two communities that Mm -hmm. you're now able to cater to. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to your point, to the evolution of the escape room, the third, because this is a three-story building. So the third store so the third story is the maximum security level. So you've got the typical bars and all of that, the cell blocks and such upstairs. And so we thought, why not utilize this? Because right now people come in and they just see these cells, right? Why not utilize that as an escape room? And so when, if you're on the day tour and you walk in, it looks exactly like the jail would have looked if an inmate was in there. So we have towels hanging up and uniforms hanging up and books on the shelves and a pillow and blanket and all of that on the bunks. But during the night, that becomes the escape room. So all of those items and things in there are part of the clues and the puzzles. And so um, cool. so, yeah, so it was one of those things. I love escape rooms. I've been you know doing them for years. So 
It's like, this is a very natural fit. It's a, it's a very interesting storyline that we can create using items that you would find in a jail cell or that could be smuggled into a jail cell. And, you know, it fits. It's, it's not something that is forced, right? And so that's why I'm, I'm very proud of that. It took me about three weeks to come up with all of the clues and puzzles. There's, I think, 20, wow. there's about 22 of them that require you to, to, you have to solve to get out of the entire cell block. But it's a lot of fun. You know, we had a group here last night. They've never done an escape room before and they were a blast. And to me, I love it because in the scenario, I'm the jailer or Miranda is the jailer. And so Mm -hmm. we watch because we're there, you know, just to watch, make sure they don't have any problems. And I love it. It is such to me, it's such a study in, you know, personal human experience. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) A social study of how people operate because I get to see these people. Obviously, one becomes a leader. One becomes a follower, one becomes the problem solver. And, uh, you know, I love it. I can sit and watch this all day. And so to me, that's just personally gratifying. But to your point, it's one of those things that has evolved to include some different things here that the community can uh, enjoy and partake in. Oh, my gosh, that's awesome. I love that evolution piece and how you've built things that relate to one another so that Mm -hmm. you aren't, even though it's you and Miranda there and you and your sisters over here, and you're still able to make everything work without complete overwhelm, right? You're, mm-hmm. I'm sure that you overlap each other in both businesses so that you being the common denominator in both can still be in both without feeling overwhelmed. And Absolutely. you've created this as your soul. Like now the, this is your income. This is your this is lifestyle yeah. that you're able to do what you love. I have moved to Tennessee. Yes. <laughs> And you moved to Tennessee. So tell us too, whereabouts in Tennessee is Scott County? So if people wanted to tag this onto a trip somewhere to Nashville along the way, like Mm -hmm. how does that all work? So we're in East Tennessee, so Northeast Tennessee, really. So we're about an hour west of Knoxville. Oh, right on. I mean, it's a a pretty straight shot right up to I-75. There's an exit for Scott County in Huntsville. So it, it is a very rural town, but it has, uh, you know, you can get to things easily. Uh, Somerset, Kentucky is about 45 minute hour drive north of us. Nashville, I think, is about two and a half hours, three hours to the west of us. Chattanooga is so about two hours. If you're road hour. tripping, you can plan yeah. to go through. Mm-hmm, That's absolutely. something for sure. Yeah, like I said, it's about 15 minutes right off I 75. Nice. Well, of course, we are going to have links to all of your um, items, your websites, both websites, Soul Sisters, Paranormal, and the Historic Scott County Jail, so people can find out and the podcast. Like, I want to talk about the podcast before we go too, because you've created this video podcast. When did that come into the piece as that well? Was, like, Yeah, that was something, again, that we had planned to do. And so it's called The Jailhouse Informant. And so it's really a mixture of true crime, some interesting facts about Scott County and some different things like that. We've got, I think, six episodes. We did have to take a little bit of a, of a hiatus this, this last couple of months, um, just because we were working on getting some different tours established. But we do have our next guest lined up, so we will be starting that back up again um, here probably within the next two weeks, and then we'll just have guests lined up, you know, after that. But um, it's something that Miranda and I, you know, we've always been fascinated with. She has her own podcast with Ghost Biker Explorations, so it's something that she was very familiar with. I've been guest on numerous podcasts, so we knew we wanted to have that aspect for people who really couldn't get here, but still wanted uh-huh. to be kind of involved in what we were doing. So again, that was always on the plan as something to do, and yeah. We really do enjoy it because we get to meet a lot of interesting people. Totally. And that's a way to broaden as well, because Mm -hmm. you're not only sharing your story, you're sharing other true crime stories from across the country or Mm -hmm. or different investigators and people who come on. So Mm -hmm. super cool. So we will also link to the podcast. There's really a lot of great information. And, you know, congratulations to you for pulling it all together and doing it in a just a succinct way with style. I mean, that's really what comes across. It's professional. There is a good momentum behind everything that you do and you've really achieved something with that. So congratulations. Thank you. you. Really appreciate that. And thank you so much for being here, Dr. Christy Sumner of Soul Sisters Paranormal and the historic Scott County Jail. We'll have links to everything in the show notes. So thank you all and we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining me today. You can access more info in the show notes at thelonggamepodcast.net. If today's show connected with you in some way, please share it with your friends or hop on iTunes and leave me a review. Until next time, keep playing the long game.